three floors of a block of flats and one missile. The capital Kyiv today. Two people were killed and more were injured. We managed to escape. We were in the kitchen. We were lucky. It was a direct hit into the living room. My wife and elder child have their legs broken. They have legs broken open. The younger one was taken somewhere by the rescuers. I'm looking for him now. Russia says it is only attacking military targets. Ukrainian defiance wherever, whenever, however. Ukrainian army sources say they destroyed this Russian convoy. In truth, they know they cannot stop the Russian advance, merely slow it. And in northeastern Ukraine, that meant standing in front of advancing Russian tanks. Melitopol, way down south on the coast, an elderly man confronts Russian troops. He says, this is my country, my country. Don't you have problems in your own country? I don't actually see a total overrunning of a country which is almost the size of France with 45 million people in it plus. And so that's, a, that's no simple uh, undertaking even for the post-Soviet army uh, of Russia. Russia's Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov says they don't want to occupy Ukraine. But check that against delivery. His line manager, of course, said they wouldn't invade. This from Belarus, trainloads of pain. Russia armor on the move. What we've seen in Ukraine, a fraction of what remains available. America offered to evacuate the country's president. He said, I don't want to ride, I want ammunition. Ukraine is under invasion from the north via Russia's client state Belarus, from the east via Russia itself, from the south by Russia's Crimea Peninsula and the Sea of Azov. Inside Ukraine, the key thrust is south from Belarus, approaching the capital Kyiv from the north, east and west. Ukraine's second city, Kharkiv, same tactic, now gradually being surrounded. South, the key port city, Mariupol. The Pentagon says an amphibious assault here has landed thousands of Russian troops. It's believed these forces will then link up northeast in Donetsk and Luhansk, the breakaway areas of East Ukraine. Even relocated Western embassies way out west in Lviv are now threatened by invasion routes south from Belarus. Lviv today queues again civilians signing up as soldiers. Tellingly, national conscription no longer functions. It's locals defending their locale as best they can. Overnight, Russia in a minority of one. Of course, Moscow vetoed the UN's condemnation of Putin's war, but China's abstention, a diplomatic crumb of comfort for the West. Last night was the most horrific for Kiev since, just imagine, 1941, when it was attacked by Nazis. Since then, Turkey has moved to ban Russian warships from the Black Sea and France intercepted this freighter in the Channel, bound for Russia under sanctions rules. East to Berlin, Poland and Lithuania want more, much more from Germany than sending Ukraine 5,000 helmets. 5,000 helmets? This must be a job. Das ist ein Witz. Das muss ein Witz sein. We have to deliver real support for the Ukrainian population. All the while, Russian TV is showing more armor crossing. This, it said, into the disputed Luhansk region in the east of the country, as Russia at home assaults social media, restricting some access to Facebook. 
for millions of Ukrainians, another night tonight will be in Sela's bunkers, Kiev's underground system. Nights they could not have imagined even a week ago. And here, one new Ukrainian life began, again with a mum who could scarcely have imagined this so recently. Hello, hello. Above ground, they stream out west in the precious uncurfewed hours of daylight. To Poland, to Romania, to safety. Well, as Russian troops continue advancing into Ukraine, they are meeting stiff resistance from Ukrainian forces backed by newly armed volunteers. Our international editor, Lindsay Hilsom, drove south from Dnipro to the city of Zaporizhia. She's back in Dnipro now. Lindsay. Kathy, the lights have just gone out at, on the street where I am as the curfew has come into force. The strategy of defiance here hasn't yet made contact with the enemy. But I keep thinking today about morale. What is the morale and motivation of the Russian forces? Because all this time they've been told that they were not going to invade Ukraine. They were on exercises. President Putin was clear that wasn't what they were going to do. And yet that is exactly what they've been told to do. And many of those Russian soldiers, well, they will have had grandparents who are Ukrainian, maybe even one parent Ukrainian, one parent Russian, because these two countries are very wound together. So it is interesting to think what on earth is going through their minds at the moment. We do know what is going through the minds of the Ukrainian defence forces. I spent quite a lot of time with them today. I talked to one young man who said, look, I have no nostalgia for the Soviet Union. I wasn't born then. I was born in a free, democratic, sovereign country called Ukraine. And that is what I am here to defend. He was one of the people I met at the checkpoint. This is how our day started. Not over their heads, but straight into their hearts. Volunteers train at a checkpoint south of Dnipro, Ukraine's third city. These are the men from the territorial defence. They're going to defend Dnipro because they know that the Russians could come in from Kharkiv to the north or from the south, from Mariupol. And that's why they're here today preparing, getting ready, saying they will defend their city to the end. Russian tanks are still 200 kilometres away, but the Ukrainians are digging trenches, ready for the expected assault. The fact that President Zelensky has remained in Kiev despite the obvious risk has encouraged them. President Biden, he said uh, we can take you from Ukraine, uh, but he's still in Ukraine. He, he protects with us. So it's very like, uh, you know, we feel this together. So that's important to you that President yes, Zelensky sure, has remained sure. in Kiev? Yeah. Yes. Why is it so important? Uh, you know, when the first uh, person uh, of the Ukraine uh, tell to the Russian president, we're ready for you. We're going to protect our land. Uh, we're strong. Our people here like uh, feel strong with Makes our president. So strong. Yeah. Further south, we pass a few military vehicles along a road that's safe, at least for now. We cross the massive hydroelectric dam at Zaporizhia. Soviet forces destroyed it in World War II to hold up the German advance. Could the same happen again? and on through the town with its wide central boulevard to the southern end, where they're sandbagging another checkpoint and recording a message to a world that sent more thoughts and prayers than weapons. No one could know when the Russians might come. Тільки все вишні, як тому, що їх б'ють, і вони кружляють, кружляють. Вони розуміють, що їх Україна б'є їх з усіх сторін. Тому хто як вони туди їм там їх там б'ють. Вони крутяться, вони як бігають, як загнані, як загнані криса забув як англійською ред. Regular Ukrainian forces have been fighting in Melitopol and Mariupol to the south. They retain control of the cities but civilians are increasingly anxious. I am located on the west side of Mariupol, and there are the Grades and the heavy artillery. The front is very intensive, especially in the morning. The night was more or less quiet, even. As a rule, in the morning, at 5-6 o'clock, the shots start. 
вот обоюдно. Но очень много наших войск, поддержка очень серьезная. Most of his relatives left already, but he was bringing out his elderly father and another important member of the family. It's a David and Goliath struggle, but we remember that parable because David's victory was so unlikely. Normally, it's Goliath who prevails. Lindsay Hilson reporting there. Well, earlier I spoke to the former Ukrainian defence minister, Andrei Zagorodinyuk, and I began by asking him if he thought Vladimir Putin was surprised by the extent of the resistance as his forces tried to take Kyiv. We know that he's surprised. Uh, we know that he's surprised because we know how uh, certain he was in his, uh, uh, in his ability to conquer within a, from one to four days. And uh, he was absolutely certain that overwhelming power uh, with the uh, manpower and equipment, and particularly air supremacy, so-called, when they can control the air uh, space uh, with the, and, and easily do any types of missile strikes and airstrikes. So all that was supposed to totally destroy the Ukrainian uh, ability to uh, defend, and, uh, and that would be pretty much it. Uh, we, we think it was premature because because there were people who were telling like how the things are going to develop. We were they were telling people how how people hate Russia idea of Russian occupation as a, as just a concept that all um, uh, all uh, population will be against uh, uh, against the occupants that uh, armed forces will be working in the groups which would be very difficult to target from the planes that we have equipment including from coming from UK and from other countries US and so on which uh, which is highly mobile and which can target the armed vehicles which is the basis for the ground uh, ground invasion and so on but they still started that mm. and now uh, they're clearly failing so well, so yeah i think he's surprised he should be surprised and we've seen the pictures of ordinary civilians arming themselves, making Molotov cocktails yeah. and so on. Are you arming yourself? Are you preparing to fight? Uh, well, every citizen prepares to fight. So different people doing different uh, types of uh, uh, activities. I have to say, every person I know of my friends uh, already have weapons ready. And you yourself? OK. And that's, uh, you, put the, yeah, you put the bullets here and that's how it works. Right. I was going to it's ask a, if you knew how to operate it. Like I assumed you did. I'm, I'm assuming perhaps you've been trained in... in is, it, is that a Kalashnikov? I'm sorry, I don't know. But... No, 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 no. This is, a, this is basically it's a personal gun. It's not Kalashnikov, no. It's, a, it's, a, it's for, for personal protection. So it's not an assault rifle. How but long have you, you had well, that, you passed though? through the certain courses and so on, but uh, no, it's not, uh, it's not the, uh, like a real assault rifle for military. But how it's long have you had that gun, than... then? Uh, that particularly one, like uh, two weeks. You've described the Ukrainian resistance and how determined you are to resist the Russian onslaught. So what do you make of the continuing disagreements within the EU over sanctions that, you know, it's too late to stop Ukraine being attacked now, and yet the EU still can't agree on excluding Russia from the SWIFT financial system, for example? What we know is that most of the countries already agreed, so I think it's just a matter of time concerning SWIFT. But generally speaking, yes, uh, continental Europe. So UK uh, has been always a pioneer of the of the deterrence measures. So uh, absolutely, and uh, US as well. Uh, and uh, but but the problem was the continental European. Some of the continental European countries, indeed, they were reluctant because they had a very strong financial ties and they they had a lobbying power which was saying, yeah, we need to. But honestly speaking, even they were shocked uh, with the fact that uh, Putin still started the war because lots of them were thinking that he's bluffing or he wants to do some compromise or he will do some some very limited campaign and so on. No, he did a flow blown campaign on a number of the uh, uh, activities. Uh, and of course, everybody was shocked that uh, it actually happened. But even after that, we've seen that some politicians weren't so happy to uh, to move with the like really big, big sanctions, which we do think. If Russia is isolated for the time when their troops are in Ukrainian ground, when it's isolated from the civilized world, when they're losing tens of billions a day of not received revenues, when the banking system doesn't work and so on, we believe that Russian establishment and Russian people will start to apply pressure to say, OK, we need to stop it because we are we're killing our own country now. And I just finally, I wanted to ask what you thought of President Zelensky's conduct. If you think that you know, he's been lauded as a hero by many in the world, do you think yeah. it would be advisable for him to leave Kiev now? 
No, he's not going to be honest. Whatever the advice comes, I mean, he's not going to listen to it. So he's going to stay. Uh, I know, a I know his kind of personality, and it's not the type of person who runs away. Uh, his behavior been exemplary, to be honest. Everybody uh, in Ukraine, I mean, uh, are uh, honestly many people are very surprised with the way how he behaves because uh, he always was. Uh, he, he, this is a, his first political job uh, in his life, and lots of people were wondering how he's going to react if the real problem starts if like a real war starts but uh he's leading by example lots of people now so yeah it's uh, it's amazing to be honest it's uh, it's uh, it's incredible in a way andrei zagardinyuk thank you very much for thank joining you. us well, for millions of Ukrainians, life has suddenly turned into an absolute nightmare. A short time ago, I spoke to Alina Kurska, a young woman who lives in Kiev and is now hiding in her flat with her mum and aunt. She began by telling me what she has witnessed and heard in the last 24 hours from her home. Uh, last evening, we heard the alarms. That's why we went with my family to the bomb shelter. So half of the night was spent in the bomb shelter. Then we came back home and in the morning we heard large explosions. Uh, a rocket missile hit an apartment building just three kilometers from my place. And that's really terrifying and awful. Mm. So like during the whole day, we're hearing some explosions, we're hearing some shootings. And of course, all the time we are on the alarm, uh, ready to go to the bomb shelter in case need be. What's going through your mind now, Alina? It's hard to believe that this situation is happening with a democratic state in the 21st century. And you live with your mum and your aunt, don't you? I wonder, are you thinking of escaping with them? Are you thinking of fleeing? You know, for now, it's hard to realize because Kiev, I'm leaving Kiev. And these days, Kiev became like a hot zone of the conflict. So there are fights in almost in all regions of Kiev. And even if we want to go, for example, to the train station, like it's not safe to go on the roads. I know that there are some trains which are evacuating people to the west, but still it's not safe to be on the roads. Do you feel that, you know, last night, did you get any sleep in the underground shelter? Uh, we didn't get any sleep in the shelter because, you know, when you feel like when you feel so frightened, it's hard to sleep. And how are your mum and aunt doing? Well, you know, uh, they, are, they are really terrifying. We try to, like, you know, motiv motivate one, ano one another and we try to be hopeful, but still uh, it, it's really hard mentally. Again, again, I, I hear the explosions. That's why, like, staying in such a situation, it's, it's really hard psychically and uh, mentally. What do you fear for yourself and your family in the next few days? You know, the biggest fear is an air attack. And it's really hard, so when you are in an apartment, the biggest fear is that there's going to be a missile rocket, which you cannot escape. Alina Kurska, thank you very much for talking to us. Thanks. Take care. Well, joining me now from Moscow is the journalist and filmmaker Mikhail Ziga, who founded Russia's only independent television news channel, Dusht. Uh, Mikhail Ziga, when you look at the fact that there's protests on the streets of Russia, do you think Vladimir Putin has started a war here that doesn't have the support of his people? You know, it's always hard to, um, to tell the real, uh, mm, the real will of Russian people because we, we, don't, we don't know enough, we don't have any information, we don't have any reliable surveys. Uh, definitely, uh, the, pro the protests we've been witnessing uh, a couple of days ago were massive, but they were not and, and the, the reaction of the authorities was also very, very brutal. Uh, we had up, up to 2,000 uh, people arrested within a couple of hours. Um, according to the latest survey, I cannot fully trust, but still uh, uh, the numbers are very surprising. Uh, about 50% um, of um, all the participants uh, disapprove and disagree with the war. That's um, uh, probably the highest amount of... Uh, um, of people uh, verbally and vocally disproving uh, Putin's policy. And, you know, and at the same time, people are definitely very polarized on, right. on the social media. Um, a couple of days ago, um, uh, together with uh, some uh, biggest names in Russia, with, with most prominent writers, uh, artists, uh, fil filmmakers, we, we wrote um, a letter denouncing the war uh, saying that we do not believe uh, what Putin says, right. and we 
are urging, we're demanding to stop the war. And, you know, and the fighting, uh, uh, the online fi fighting has started. I, I'm getting personally lots of uh, uh, demands. Uh, yeah. You burn in hell and you um, mm. leave and go to, uh, go to Ukraine. At the same time, thousands of people are writing me um, on a daily basis, asking me to add their signatures, to add their names um, under that letter. Right, so very polarised. But is there a, a more unity on the uh, opposition to the, the fact that the sanctions are going to really harm Russia's economy? Is that worrying people? Uh, you know, it's hard. It's hard to, uh, it's hard to tell um, if... It's hard to tell, have we really realized what has happened because many people understand that uh the world we know has been ruined we we uh many of us understand including myself i think that that our country uh that uh, everything is over that the future we've been um, hoping for is over russia will never be uh will never be able to uh, to have business as usual again. So right. we, we are running straight into the Middle Ages uh, without um, without banking system, without uh, normal flights, without uh, um, uh, free without normal way of life. Everyone ha has got used to. And uh, speaking Nicole. about the media, uh, Mikhail, we, we've got. I'm so sorry. We yeah, we have sorry. run out of time. But Mikhail Ziga, thank you very much for joining us. Well, the UN said today that more than 150,000 refugees have left Ukraine since the invasion began, most of them heading to Poland, others managing to get into other neighbouring countries like Slovakia. Our reporter, Porek O'Brien, has spent the day at the Slovakian border town of Ubla, and he joins us from there now. Porek. Cathy, as you said yesterday, we were reporting from the border with Poland and Ukraine. This morning we drove just three or four hours up over the mountains to the border here with uh, Slovakia and Ukraine. Um, this war is having all sorts of ramifications for the neighbouring countries around Ukraine, and not just in terms of the refugee crisis, which you're seeing unfolding here behind me. So, for example, uh, tomorrow, opposition leaders in Belarus have called for anti-war demonstrations on the streets of Belarus. What those opposition leaders are hoping for is that that will spark mass demonstrations, the like of which we saw back about two years ago, if, and it's still a big if, the numbers show up on the streets. Remember, Lukashenko partnered with Putin when it came to this war. But geopolitics aside, we spent the day here in Slovakia on the border asking people coming through the gate behind me what the crisis in refugee crisis means to them. Yesterday, the UN said an estimated 100,000 Ukrainians had had to leave their homes. That was yesterday. At the border crossing between Ukraine and Slovakia, people are waiting up to 10 hours to get across. Yesterday, 10,000 people crossed into this country. Maria is eight months pregnant. She's an organizer. Herself and her husband had saved up to decorate a room for the new arrival. Now, she's also an organized refugee. Fold up chair for the walk that took hours, check. How do you feel about the prospect that your child won't be born or might not be born at home? Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, a lot of feelings, yeah. <laughs> A lot I am, of, yeah. I, I, sorry, I, I understand. Uh, if there will be a case to return in a month, like previously, like before the birth, like giving a birth, if I would have such option, I would do with that really, 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 like happily, seriously. Would you? For sure, yeah, because uh, yeah, because I, I, I really want to see my husband, dog, and everywhere, like yeah, seriously, yeah. Yeah. So it is like for me, it is like better than to be here because, uh, you know, uh, like eight months, I don't have any money because we had renovations. We didn't expect to have any war or something like that. Thousands and thousands of people are coming across from Ukraine into Poland, Hungary, Romania, Moldova, and Slovakia. 
So the queues here on the Slovakian side aren't quite as long as on the Polish side, but the queue on the other side of the gate here, we're talking about people waiting for about 10 hours or so. In this part of the world, solidarity just doesn't come in the shape of lethal aid or rhetoric, by the way. The Slovakian government has announced that people arriving here like these people will get free health care, they will get temporary work visas and they will be given free transport. So a real sense of a country and civic society rallying together. Vladimir is waiting for his mother. She's been in the queue for hours. His father, at 57, just inside the conscription age of 18 to 60, is staying in Ukraine to defend his neighbourhood. Their son has been living and working in Poland for the last eight years. Some of my other relatives, they refused to leave the town, unfortunately, and now they have... And what about your father? Is he going to leave? Are you okay? No, I'm not. At least I will see my mother soon. The people we met were incredibly resilient, being strong for themselves and those fighting back home. There are layers to the anguish of having to leave, though. The leaving is just the start of it. Because then come the questions. If I ever return, what sort of country will it be? And if I do go back, who will be waiting for me? Well, joining me now is the German MEP, David McAllister, who's chair of the European Parliament's Foreign Relations Committee. Mr McAllister, Germany is belatedly agreeing to exclude Russia from the SWIFT financial system. I just wonder, other countries signed up quite a while ago. What took Germany so long? Russian invasion of Ukraine is the most serious violation of international law in Europe since the Second World War. And this is an attack on our way of life, our democracy, our freedom and our security architecture. That's why I welcome that the European member states, European Union member states adopted a whole package of sanctions this week. But they also reserve the right to take further steps should there be a further escalation. And one of the things which is still on the table is, of course, to exclude Russia from the SWIFT system. And I believe that this will come and it has to come. And it's extraordinary, isn't it? Tonight, just as we came on air, there was an announcement that Germany had agreed to supply anti-tank weapons and surface-to-air missiles to Ukraine. It's been described as a turning point. In your view, how landmark a moment is this for your country? Yes, the German government has decided to change its position. We, as a Christian Democratic Union, my party in Germany, were calling for this for a longer time now. The situation is so serious that the German government obviously has decided to loosen its very tight position on exporting weapons in conflict zones. It is now about showing solidarity with Ukraine and supporting Ukraine in its heroic defence against this Russian invasion. Obviously, there are terrible echoes of the past. Um, people talking about the reverberations from World War II. In your country particularly, those must be particularly painful echoes, are they? Germany traditionally always has a very restrictive weapons export policy. Our policy in Germany is not to send, not to deliver weapons into conflict zones, but there have been exceptions from this position. For instance, Germany delivered weapons to the Peshmerga in their fight against ISIS, and also Germany has delivered submarines to Europe, uh, to Israel. So there have been exceptions from this rule, and this situation in Ukraine is a watershed moment. So I welcome that the German government has finally changed its position. When you look at the array of sanctions and you look at the military support and weaponry that we've been talking about, a lot of people will wonder, where does this end? What does this lead to? The European Union, in close coordination with our allies, the United States, Canada, the United Kingdom and other like-minded partners like Japan and South Korea or Australia, have adopted a sanctions package which is unprecedented, and this will hit the Russian economy 
hard, but still, in light of recent developments, in light of the latest attacks against Soviet civilian areas, residential areas and civilian infrastructure, I believe that a further package will be necessary, and this includes to exclude Russia from the SWIFT system. I could also think about a ban of Aeroflot flights into EU territory. But there will also be reprisals, won't there, for European economies? You know, Russia will hit back. Yes, Russia will try to hit back, uh, but I believe that our sanctions will hit Russia much harder, especially because of it, why the, the European Union is the largest economic trading partner of Russia. But of course, we will have to bear the consequences, but it's now showing solidarity with Ukraine, and it's about defending European democracy, the rule of law, and the whole peace and security architecture 